even with all of the hype and growth in the industry, more and more people are here working with essential oils. I'm told from some of the highest sources that internationally we might use about 5% of essential oils in so-called aromatherapy. 95% of what's produced is going in food. How ironic that so many authors say you must never ever, if you take the three-year Valerie Burwood course in London, before you get your certificate, you have to go, I solemnly swear I would never use essential oils in turn. You are chewing gum at the break. And I'm like, the peppermint I'll pass around soon is the same one that's in Wrigley's gum. I know the people that grow the mint in, in Washington, in Oregon and Washington are where this island, Turtle Island's best mint comes from. Right? So, anyway, so, you know, how many of you have made, I'm sure in this crowd it's going to be most of you, but how many of you grew up in a home and still do make things like dill pickles? So, you know, you got, you got a recipe you got from grandma kind of thing, but, I mean, do you actually weigh... The, the dill seeds in micrograms before you stuff it in a jar. We just take some and stuff it in the jar. So are you willing to admit that every jar you open is just a little bit different? Consumers want things to be the same. So at companies like Bix, there's a railway car out there full of vinegar and another one full of uh, pure water. And there's a lady in a lap coat that takes a beaker out and fills it with dill essential oil and pours it into those huge tanks so that every jar is the same. Virtually everything in a candy store, largest consumers of essential oils in the world, of, of Denmark. That's where most of the world's candy comes from. So you go to a candy store, virtually everything in the store is made with essential oils. But it's all about the dosage, right? Because there's stuff that'll... That's why we say external use only, because there's a lot of things in the oils I work with that if you took a couple of drops for a sore throat, that's one thing. But if you had a shot, you wouldn't have tonsils left. You know, and it, you know it's a thing. But it's something I always have some fun with is uh, just show you. Remember one night, anybody watch Bill Maher? He's a political satirist. I, I've always thought he's on the first run of Friday nights. And one night in his show, in the middle of an interview, they, they weren't talking about food at all. He just looked at this author and went, did you know there's no fruit, fruit loops? And, and, the, and the whole crowd kind of thought that was pretty cool. So three times later in the show, he did that same line. He, he just, with different guests, he did, did you know there's no fruit, fruit loops? <laughs> what I'm doing is making without all the sugar and red dye you could pour and do that number six on the inside. I'm making wine cups. Or tropi tropical fruit. Yeah, that's something I want extra top cardinal. So I have to grab it. Well, see, I'm not nervous, I just need to see. There you go. Now, what you're smelling is mostly hydrocarbons. We, we live in a hydrocarbon town, in a hydrocarbon and um, so uh, anybody here buys Zep, you can get it at Home Depot. It's, it's the best thing to use if like, if I'm pouring a five gallon jug of almond oil on this shirt and I get a, get a big split, you pour a little Zep on it and you throw it in the laundry and it comes out perfectly clean. Number one ingredient is orange. Now I can't make that stuff myself. I've got over $200,000 worth of inventory with this stuff. Just trying to keep people supplied. I've got practitioners, fellow herbalists, estheticians, massage therapists from coast to coast. And I try and buy as much as I possibly can to get good prices and that sort of thing. But, you know, truthfully, like, this much orange isn't worth anything. This much orange is worth nothing. This cap comes from Austria. That's worth something. And these little bottles come from somewhere else in Europe, and somebody with a good attitude has to fill those silly things, and we've got to put a label on them, and then we want 
nice, happy people at a place like the Light Cellar selling them with smiles on their faces, right? But I mean, it's like, I mean, I remember uh, years ago, a friend of mine was, first big job out of high school, he was managing a Pepsi-Cola plant. And at the time, soft drinks sold for something like 30 cents, maybe even less. The reason they instigated that, we'll give you a nickel back for the bottle, was the bottles cost them $1.46. They had to fill the same bottle 11 times before that bottle generated a profit. The actual soft drink isn't worth anything. And that's consumerism, you know, whether it's a lipstick or a soft drink or whatever. It's packaging and shipping and all that. But, so the point is, that's a nice, clean, fresh smell to brighten up a room with a diffuser, right? Kids love it. You get cranky kids. You give them some lime and they're all in. Okay. But that's actually a really good one. I've got a whiteboard, which I don't think that is. Yeah, um, I, I, I don't need one. I, I just like to, you know, there's always a little bit of leftover stuff in a whiteboard. And, and if you take one of those now and just buff the whiteboard with it, it is flawlessly clean. You know? So I think of another, uh, we lost him a few years ago, but George Carlin, and, and I stole some of his lines from people like, it's a floor wax. No, it's a dessert topping. Wrong again, it's a floor wax and a dessert topping. This tastes great, Mom, and look at that shine. <laughs> you know, so, um, you know, you can do an awful lot. So if I get a tiny little spot on something, like a cotton shirt, a drop of lemon, but if it's a big mess, um, I get out the zap. And that's really nice for... Um, How do you spell it? Just like it sounds, Z-E-P. There's three colors. I'm not sure what the blue one's for. Um, the one you want is orange. It's, it's a bright orange color. And um, I had, you know, I, I'm constantly learning from my clients, of course. And uh, I had this whole discussion where a woman who used to live in Airdrie prompted me with a supplier to bring in pistachio oil, which has a beautiful finish on the skin. Uh, if you look at the chemistry of it, it's actually almost identical to uh, sesame. And I haven't been able to get pistachio for a few years, so I usually just put people with that. So she said, look, it's beautiful on the skin and it launders well. And so I made this recommendation to a woman in Jasper who I've never met. And she called me some weeks later and said, well, that was the worst advice ever. My sheets are a bigger mess than they used to be. It would be almond oil or whatever. I ran into the first lady some weeks later somewhere, like on the mall or whatever, and she said, oh, that's because she's using cheap sheets. I remember when fleece first came out, having grown up a river rat in northern Saskatchewan, I'll be heading there on Friday to chase fish and swim in some of those cold northern waters. And I love catching large fish in water where at no point when I'm fishing all of next week would I not dip a cup and drink. Most countries, you can't do that, right? It's just such a privilege to be Canadian. I realize that isn't everywhere, but. It's just so nice to, to have, especially an animal product coming from pristine landscape, right? So, anyway. Um, when fleece first came out, river rats loved it because it dries so quick. Like, down's warm, and you can stuff an awful lot of down things into a kayak, but if it gets wet, it takes three days to dry a down sleeping bag, and you can hang a, a fleece sleeping bag on a rope on a day like today, and it's dry in about 45 minutes out of the zipper. But stink factor, you know, as soon as we were all wearing fleece paddling long trips, everybody stunk, you know, and, and we realized there, there's other things that you can use to keep your fleece clean, sort of thing. So anyway, um, cleaning products, etc. So uh, there's a lot going on. Now, when I got into essential oils, rather, taking over my life, um, the two biggest attractions were respiratory distress, because bang for your buck wise, there's nothing out there that's cheaper and works better to treat anything from asthma to COPD. Like it just, and you know, there's 700 kinds of eucalyptus. And, and so to be effective, if you're gonna do things treatment wise, you've you really gotta learn some chemistry and that sort of thing. And I'll, I'll talk about a few of the, you know, the, like just to go through a basic chemistry class would take us about three hours. You know, there's a lot going on. But there's only about 10 function groups, uh, they're called, and some of them you have to be really careful with. I, I like to call them big guns. And, you know, I, I grew up doing some hunting. Uh, you don't go hunting pheasant with a bazooka, you know? And it's a, there's one on the ridge now, sir. 
There's a nine foot hole on the hillside and a bit of guts and feathers falling out of the sky, you know, and that's essentially what you're doing when you take something like red thyme or, or oregano full strength, you know, to the back of the throat. Like it's it's rude. And I mean people from countries like Australia and France think that we are absolutely can I say batshit crazy in this crowd? Like it's just insane, you know, that we're developing sensitivity. I, you know, I've, I've had people say, oh, well, can't you get oregano? I've got some really good oregano. I can say, I've got nine kinds of oregano. You know when I used some last? I don't even remember. Why? Because I've never needed it. I haven't used a bazooka in the last 10 years either. You, know, but it, it, you see what I'm saying? So something I really like to stress is lots of little doses. And you can, you can work with oils for years and not have any problems, and then all of a sudden something or somebody's gonna really backfire on you. So wherever you have oils, whether that's in your purse, your glove box, camping kit, whatever, you should have at least a little aisle, even just something this size that you got hotel shampoo in years ago. With whatever you've got in your uh, kitchen for, uh, not coconut oil, because it's a solid, but it's so easy to say, take a drop or two of peppermint at a red light because you've got a big date or a big meeting or whatever, and kind of grow your gums. And in fact, why don't I do that? Um, so you can get a drop, or I don't care if you get three. Here, I'll use a dry finger. So do your gums, and you take a really deep breath. Close your mouth, and it'll swirl up through the nasal palate and canals, you know. So this time you hear a lot of people have hay fever, and that sort of thing, and it's just like, whoa. Crystal clear, I'm awake now. Now, the thing is, you better not stick this finger in your eye, up your nose, or any other orifice uh, if you go to the bathroom or something like that, because it's not going to be happy. There was, um, so one that I, I threw in today is jojoba oil. It doesn't need to be jojoba, that's a little more expensive. I mean, whatever you got in your kitchen, whether it's canola or grapeseed or olive oil or whatever, just always have a little something because. Even the Poison Control Center doesn't seem to understand this. And a couple of years ago, after spending five days out in the foothills up by Burt Timber with, um, I think it was 13 women who were camping and set up a, a field lab, and so we were making creams and tinctures and things like that right from the forest and some of our meals too. So um, my ex-wife had, she wasn't using it at all, and she, she lent, it became a gift eventually, uh, a can of air spray. And um, she didn't realize that the little safety tap to make sure you don't misfire it, you, you don't actually, you don't cut that little zip tie off. It's just loose enough that if, if it comes out of there, you don't lose it. You, and if you actually need the spray, you, there's enough slack in the zip tie to slide it out. But, so with the on, off, on, off, on, off, um, we had 13 women in a room and I said, okay, we see grizzly every year up there. And um, like, as long as everybody's comfortable, I've got bear bangers, bear spray, a legally registered sawed-off 12 gauge with, with five slugs in it that would cut a Volkswagen in half. Uh, is, does anybody have a problem if I bring the No, bring guns! Yeah, bring the guns! Yeah, yeah, bring, bring it all! Yeah, okay. So I got all this gear, I feel like an old cowboy, you know, and, and then I'm going to stop and talk about a plant for 15 minutes. So anyway, I didn't realize uh, that on the last day of our outings, uh, the safety clip had fallen off somewhere on a rock or whatever. And when I got home with the uh, sequoia that's parked across the street, uh, I was going to save one trip and, and I threw one box on top or a pack or something on top of this box full of stuff. And the clip wasn't there. So I shot myself in the face, point blank, with bear spray. There was a circle this big on the inside of the lift, the hatchback lid. Well, uh, her name's Jennifer. She was walking her Pomeranian and still lived in the neighborhood. And came by to see if I was home yet, just the other week. Man. And uh, I had just done this with her bear spray. And I was laying on the street behind my truck, just screaming. And I said, "Honey, you know what to do. Run in the house and just grab whatever you see first, the olive oil. Just pour it all over my face. And, and yeah, she, she, you know, just and within seconds. And then you can go wash your face. But the last thing you want to do if somebody's having an allergic reaction is use water. So rule number one, essential oils, all of them, are hydrophobic. That's how distillation works in the first place. You take like 60,000 roses and put them in a still. Some of you smaller women might fit in the 
the stills, they do the roses, and they're only carrying baskets, hand-picked from not even here to the car wash. And they've got all these little stills uh, cooking away. So what happens when the steam comes into the cooker? Little cells, some of them are in flowers, in needles, on the bottom of leaves, and they explode in the heat. And they fly with the steam, and then there's some sort of a condenser. And what comes out the other end is a big bucket of what we call a hydrosol. That's what real rose water is. If, if you're at a pharmacy and uh, you ask for rose water, and a pharmacist, he or she says, oh, just give me a few minutes, I'll make some up for you. Run screaming. That's not going to be the hydrosol you want to put on your face, right? It's, what do you think? 64? A little puff of rose water every morning? You know, a few essentials? Not bad, I think. Just before. Spend a lot of time outdoors. It's, that's, it's pennies a day, you know? So we use things like orange blossom and sandalwood and some of them for cosmetic reasons, but hydrophobic means they're afraid of water. So they go, when they explode out of the plant tissue, they go, yippee, yippee, we can fly, yay, we got out of this pot where it's down, it was hot in here. And they go through the condenser and they go, oh, but we can't swim. So distilled water will hold, on average, two to three parts per thousand of essential oil. And then it's saturated. And just like if you hit a chicken with a stick and throw it in a pot, the fat rises to the top. Okay? The essential oils then dissociate from the hydrosol and, and they're separated off. Right? So some plants have lots to give and some don't. Like some of the rose EO that I have is twelve to fifteen hundred dollars an ounce. That's because it took 60,000 roses to make that ounce of oil. Can you imagine if we had a party tonight in this room and we had 60,000 roses uh, in the room? It's about this deep. And we're all squishing around in the fresh roses. Uh, you guys would be laughing like crazy. Some of you might even have an orgasm. Uh, you know, <laughs> it, there's, there's three ways to, um, I'm sure you've all heard Malcolm uh, extol the virtues of phenylethylalamine, you know, it's an amino acid, and, and there's three ways to get some, not in a can, but three things that are commonly available that'll, that'll give you a good shot of it. One of them is quality chocolate, one of them is roses, right? And you, you think about, bing bong, it's the big date, right? You got flowers and a box of chocolate, right? Well, the flowers, you get roses. That's meant to be a primer. Okay, you know, we're looking for a good time tonight. And if the date's a bust, because one of you decides the other's a loser, where are you at 11.15? Here you can in, in, in front of the TV, scoff, scoff and half a box of chocolate just to let your consolation, consolation prize. You know? <laughs> so, uh, you know, there's, there's a lot going on. So, there's, because I'm going to make some attacks here shortly. Um, when I first got into working with essential oils, um, it was for two reasons. One of them was I realized how good they are for respiratory problems. And the other one was that I've done trips as long as four months, living off the land, starting at temperatures like 27 below zero, with no food. And, and you know that movie some of you saw, I'm sure, that Into the Wilds? Uh, when I started teaching botany for Wild Rose some years ago, and I, I always thought, like, I had memoirs, and man, I had some exciting times. I got between a bear and her cubs. Uh, you know, I, I had some close calls. I'm lucky to be here at all. But uh, I thought, you know, my memoirs would make a darn good book, maybe even a screenplay. And when that film came out, I was crushed. Even though it, it was very well done, I, I appreciated the film, but I kind of I got scooped again, you know? It's, it's like, I'm too busy doing day-to-day -day things and I get scooped. But then it hit me with my first botany class. And, but I came back. <laughs> he died. So I could still do the book and the film and call it Into the Wilds, but I came back! And I got stories to tell, man. You know, so uh, there's still a window there. We'll see, we'll see how it all goes. You know? So what I really like, you know, these... You know what I'm talking about when you buy like, rare expensive stuff like jasmine or whatever. So, sidebar. It makes me crazy that some distributors will dilute, you know, 
ethically, I don't care, it makes things more affordable, but if you dilute rose or sandalwood or jasmine or something like that in, say, almond oil, in a year and a half, the almond oil is rancid. And it was still a fairly expensive buy, so now you get rancid oil with a bit of sandalwood in it. So jojoba, technically, isn't oil. It's, it's the only thing we use, uh, anything we dilute. So backing it up about five minutes. Essential oils are hydrophobic, but they're lipolytic. That means they love, love, love fat. Anything fatty will help dissolve them to make them safer for whether it's oral use or on the skin. And some of them, like a really common component, of, I've used rosewood on, uh, I remember this little infant girl, her parents had brought her, and uh, we laid out a blanket, um, and uh, when they, they got her naked, and I, I just sunk, um, she, she had vaginal candidiasis so badly that it curled out of her inside and completely covered her bottom halfway up her back and to her someday to be breast. She didn't stop crying in three days. And um, I diluted some rosewood and, and had the mother gently dab it on. And first little pats, no more tears. So I'm not saying that you should use anything, even mild like that, lavender. Neat means full strength. Eventually you're gonna have a problem, especially on sensitive skin like the back of the neck. I had this one massage therapist from Cochrane. Every time uh, he'd come see me, he'd pick up something, oh, what's this? And he would take a couple of drops and rub it on the back of his neck. I go, don't do that. No, I do this all the time. Tick tock, buddy. You know, and then he called me one day a couple months later and said, hey, I had my whole neck broke up in a rash, you know, that sort of thing. Sometimes, you know, there's a few components. Some of the citrus oils are bad for this, bergamot in particular. There's, there's a chemical called methoxy silent pea like pneumonia, methoxy seralum, 1,8 methoxy seralum. And it's reverse sunscreen. It's like SPF 150. So take a couple drops of bergamot because you like the smell, and put it on the back of your neck and go have a lunch at Earl's and you'll be blistered before you ever leave anybody a tip. And I had one guy who was, uh, when I still did photography, he was uh, an advertising art director, the guy that I worked with. And he just, he fell in love with one of my jazz runs and he wore it as a perfume all the time. And uh, he said, hey, you know, I gotta quit using the jazz run. I must have developed an allergy to it. I said, when did you use it? He said, well, I was playing around at golf on Saturday morning. And I said, you put the jazz run on your neck before you went golfing. You're not allergic to jazz. Same chemical. So what happens with some of the pretty smelling things, you're gonna run into this word absolute. And so stuff like rose and whatnot, depending on the plant, what happens is, if you think about it, rose essential oil doesn't really smell like the fresh flowers did because you cooked it. It's more like rose soup, you know? So more so for perfumery, we like originally in the old days, and a little bit of this is still done, where they take trays in places like um, well, this is still done. I, I used to have some neroli, and uh, jasmine might be done this way. So uh, I know people that would never buy jasmine because it, it slave labor for young children in Pakistan and India. And I, went, I used to get up at five in the morning to deliver flyers for my parents' corner store. I never considered it slave labor. I actually got paid for that work and, and bought more model car kits than most of my friends could afford, you know, kind of thing. And I got paid, it was work. I don't know, it's not how, how tough is that to get up early in the morning and you, you get not that long, because as soon as the sun is up, that's the end of the shift. So you got a, a basket or two of these flowers and in a shed there's all these women with hair nets on and uh, they're taking uh, tongs and they got about this much pork fat in these trays and they carefully remove every flower from yesterday and cover the surface of the fat. Uh, with, with fresh flowers, and that goes on for a couple of weeks until Uncle Rajmani, no equipment, just kind of takes a little pinch and looks at his watch and checks his notes and kind of goes, oh, smooth, yeah. So, um, in the old days, that was called a pomade. Pomade. And you just used it, the pork fat. So, uh, in, in going to a social function or going to court this morning, uh, I mean, at my age, I might have had a bath three times by now, maybe for a wedding or something like that. You know? um, so each morning when he heard me jostling, waking, uh, 
a valet would come in and, and we would make sure you brush my hair out a bit and then put it up much as it is. And then you take a glob of that fragrant fat and stick it on top of your head and you put the wig on. Those powdered wigs, that wasn't a fashion statement. That was essentially to keep the lice down or the wig would just go free ranging it, on full, full moon nights, you know, like, hey, where's my wig? No, it's gone. <laughs> Too many bucks. So you put the, the wig on, and then as you sit in court all day, body heat, it's the original deodorant, slowly melts, and you get a little trickle down your spine or between your breasts or whatever, and yeah, who needs a bath this year? Right? So in the later part of the 1800s, the petrochemical industry was starting, and uh, we got all sorts of things that we get from the petrochemical industry. Some of them are actually very useful, and I like fast cars, um, you know, some of them are whatever. So the, the funny thing is that, well, it's not funny, but I mean, helicopter fuel, by one definition, is organic. It's not the organic that most of you think about shopping in a place like this, but Organic, technically, to a chemist, is anything that's carbon-based and went through at least one living system. So, oh, what's up in the parking lot? I noticed uh, a nut that must have come off somebody's car. That's almost pure iron. Anybody here anemic? You know, you can suck on some nuts and bolts for the rest of the weekend and you're not gonna get any iron out of that, right? Because you don't have any enzymes, so you're gonna dissolve that metal. Cool, but if Gaia turns, you want really fresh iron? Go to Hawaii, get some lava. Wait for it to cool, you'll burn your lips for sure. <laughs> and then, you know, the sun and the moon and the rain turn things like lava from the bottom of the sea or on dry land, and it slowly breaks down. And plants as familiar to you as raspberries can process the iron in the dirt, and there's a safe amount of iron in the leaves, and you could, like for Laura right now, did anybody notice that's not too much chocolate? No. Okay. Um, and, and so we want all that skin, because she's normally a tiny little thing, and when the baby comes in August, we want that skin to come back. So it's really good to take during pregnancy. You, by the time you start to show, at the end of the first trimester, you start a cup a day, and towards birthing, you get four to six cups a day. And, and the skin stretches back, and then, oh, you're gonna pass something that big, no, no, uh, no offense to Malcolm, but that baby's gonna pass through an orifice that's used to much smaller devices. And, and so when you're gonna have a nice natural birth, you know, and, and you know, it, it helps with the pain and, and delivery and all of that. It's like a lady's best friend. You can tell I've used some of these stories before. That's really cheap. That's really cheap, yeah. And it, it's also just a little bit astringent, so it's, um, it's a nice one for if baby has diarrhea or if you've had a bad cold and you've used stronger things for a day or two to get rid of the cold but you're still just a little mute to see and sniffly, put a pot on and just sip it all day and then it'll just dry things up. Right? So, rashes, things like that, hives. And it's virtually free. I mean, if you've got a raspberry patch, if normal raspberries have a perennial root system that each plant lives for two years. So the ones in my yard get about this high, and they have a lot of nice big leaves. And then next year, that cane grows another three feet and breaks out the flowers and gives you berries. So you don't want to take all the terminal growth, and you don't want to take all the leaves from any one stem because you're kind of robbing the root system. And if you take the terminal ones, you're, you're bonsaiing it, and you might not get any fruit next year. So you know every year there's some whether you do it like I think the leaves are healthier, kind of well, August frankly. Don't wait till the fall because a lot of them are dying back already. So, I mean, even July, depending on what spring was like. Do we have spring this year? Do we have so, um, on carriers for a minute. Back to Jojoba. That's the only one that will never, ever, 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 ever leave that in the trunk of a black sedan that lives in a parking lot. It will never go rancid. So that's the only thing I want to dilute rare expensive things with okay and then uh, i segued there with uh, when solvents some of the petroleum-based solvents came out most manufacturers did away with the pork fat 
and they soak the plant material in solvent. Now the advantage of that, in some cases, you get more yield. So the rose essential oil that I sell is three times the price of the absolute. But with Ylang Ylang, it's the other way around. The, the yields change, just depends on the plant. I've got some Ylang Ylang absolute that's absolutely beautiful, and it's at least three times the price, maybe even four times the price of the regular Ylang Ylang that I have myself. So you, you know, but the point is, there was no heat. So it smells more like the fresh flower did. Right? But we have to get the solvent out. Now a lot of people read about that and think, oh, we're going to do something. If, if you have ever eaten something like Thousand Island dressing from a company like Kraft, you've been eating hexane and benzene residues your whole life. So when you see cold pressed on a label, big peeve when I started doing all of this, that I'd, I'd have somebody with bad arthritis and they're looking at the label and they want to make sure that what they're going to put on their knees is a cold pressed oil. And they just came from Peter's drive-in. And, and had a burger and not such good cheese and a salad. And, you know, like, if you're gonna put that stuff in your mouth, why are you even concerned when you're running on your sore knee? Like, switch that up. So, cold press is a bit of a misnomer because there's no cold involved, there just isn't any heat. And the reason some of the ones that we love, especially for facial use, uh, oh, the technology on evening primrose, for example, a lot of that came from Canada. The rose hip seed oil comes mostly from Chile. If you look at evening primrose seed, can you all picture poppy seed? Poppy seed is huge. Evening primrose seed is like dust. And it has what's called an indeterminate inflorescence, meaning it's already mature seeds down here, and then here there's some flowers that are just wilting, and here there's some flowers that are open, and here there's more buds coming. It's like fireweed. They're cousins. So the whole flower arrangement by the end of the summer can be this long. When do you harvest it? So it's hand-picked. Most of it comes from Asia. They don't have dental plants and things like that there. So the same laborers are going back to the same plants at least five times, and they're all hand-picked. And that's what you're paying for. It's very expensive. And then how do you press the oil out of that? Like a, a new one a couple of years ago that we've been having some fun with is uh, raspberry seed oil. It's, it's a fraction of the price of rosehip oil, and, and it, we didn't even know when we first started using it. It's actually pretty darn good SPF. You know? But again, you know, think about even those are big seeds. So it takes some pretty specialized presses as opposed to crushing a bunch of almonds. Yeah. Whatever. Right? So, uh, those high-end oils, I would never use for a full body massage, but they're nice on the face where you can... So you've had a shower, washed your face, whatever, and uh, mist with a hydrosol, unless you've got something for eight times the price that you like, that's okay too, but a couple of puffs. No answering the phone and talking to mom for 15 minutes. You gotta, as soon as you're out of the shower, you blot your face, not even dry, light mist. Gravity and time are sucking your face off your skull, okay? And calorie tap, your, the coat, not, not your face, the coating on your face wants to be around 4.5 to 5, which is highly acidic. And that's because inside the body is, no matter what you eat or think or drink or do or say, your body fights and digests things with enzymes. And, and your blood's pH runs about 6.8 to 7.4, which is really attractive to bacteria. That's why if you cut yourself, it's like opening a zipper and you will get infected. So all over the body, we, we exude, you know, the... <laughs> Thank you. Now, you know when that is absolutely brilliant? Is when you got up at 3 in the morning to fly to Vancouver or Toronto or whatever, and you're kind of groggy and stuff, as soon as you get your luggage, before you even go outside, you just do a couple of puffs like that, you know, and, and you can you can reload some of that in a little one ounce bottle for the trip and it'll be fine on the plane. What is it? Rosewater. Rose water. It's okay that I'm wearing my contacts if I spray Absolutely. Okay. Well close your eyes first. Well, of course. And it, it, <laughs> no, 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 but there's some of the hydrosols um, we can actually use in the eyes. Oh really? Yeah. So so back to well let me finish this one. Oh, wow. Um, Remember what I said? Does anybody remember what I said about how many parts per thousand the hydrosol? Two. Well, two to three two parts three, per thousand. Yeah. Right? So, 
to do what I'm about to describe, you can't use tap water, it's full of junk, and you can't use mountain stream water or spring water because it's full of minerals. That's what I want to drink. Um, it must be distilled water, not because it's pure, but because distilled or on a label deionized is seven, right on, on the button, okay? So, yeah, it's distilled because it's not acidic and it's not alcohol. Calgary tap water is like 6 point, no, 6.8. Um, when I worked in the wholesale end of the beauty industry for years, we used to do crazy things at times. Like I would do highlights at hair shows. Um, my favorite was Head and Shoulders. Uh, and we used a uh, Tide laundry detergent as well. And I would do really nice blonde highlights on people with dark brown hair. With urine. Okay. Urine all hair. Um, well, sometimes I got a volunteer, you know, but, but the whole point is that you know, when you've got tap water that's that alkaline, and little baby skin wants to be 4.5, 5.5, and you mix uh, like Tide laundry detergent is about like even Johnson's and Johnson's. What what did the label always say on baby shampoo? No more tears. It was pH balanced to 9.2. So you get it in baby's eye. What happens when you cry? Your skin all turns red and swells up because you're allergic to your tears. But assuming the mothers of America were too inept to be able to wash a child, uh, you know, they made, they made the shampoo evil. You can, you can do highlights with baby shampoo. So as soon as you mix, as soon as you add nitrogen to something that alkaline, you got bleach. Right? So we would do all sorts of hair fun things just to get people to switch it up. So that's why I'm saying you've used something in the shower or at your sink and you get that tap water on you, residue, the first thing you want to do is poof with hydrosol. When they're, when they're fresh, the pH is about 4.5, which is why they don't need any sort of preservative. If they hang around the house for a couple of years, I, I've never seen rose water go off. Uh, but I've seen a few others like Rose and Mary and a few others. Two years old, what's happening is they, they oxidize slowly and, and the pH is going up. And when it gets to a certain point, they've lost their natural protection and you'll see mold growing on the dipstick or whatever. I've, I've never seen it. I've got one in my bathroom that I've been using for 20 years and when it gets that much left, I just fill it up again. It's the same bottle, it's never been sterilized. Like it, it seems to be pretty stable stuff. Right? And like anything, the bigger the bottle, the more affordable it is. So you know, estheticians and people like that would probably buy larger ones. But don't let somebody make it up from some kind of concentrate because that's water that smells like roses. You can go to Spiceland and buy a half liter of rose water for about 450. That's not a hydrosol. It's for cooking rice that smells like roses, right? And uh, the um, the whole thing for the Muslim religion was he that came down didn't get pinned on a cross. The day came when he provided some inspiration and he got called home. And you can only describe what you just witnessed with what you can comprehend, right? So the legends say a golden staircase appeared. Mohammed, it's time to come home. And as he ascended the steps, now as a botanist I know from fossil records, this is not a true story. <laughs> because we got fossils that are way older than Mohammed's time on Earth. Right? So the, how about when he finally did, he stopped at the top just before disappearing into the clouds. This might be new for you. Where the ship was! And he paused there to say goodbye. It's been swell and a quite climb. And a bead of sweat fell from his brow. And that's where the first rose sprung. So that when you do what we just all did, you're taking a little slice of divinity. And even though it's not true, I love stories like that. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, some of what we do with essential oils is aromatherapy. And when I first got into all of this as a, ther as a herbalist, I thought, wait a minute, I live and work in the redneck capital of the world. And aromatherapy sounds really flaky. So I don't want to have anything to do with that word, and I just like the word phyto, which means plant, phytotherapy, phytotherapeutics. That's my, my hand, my interest in phytotherapeutics. And sometimes it creates confusion, because if people just hear that really fast, they think I work on dogs. 
you know, and, you know, I mean, that's okay, you know, and, and in fact, um, any CKUA fans here? I've, I've been letting my proceeds once or twice a year when they have the fundraiser, I've been buying shows, and uh, I really enjoy Bubba on weekday mornings, so I'm usually working with, with Bubba from 9 till noon, and um, so I've done Roy Farms a couple of times, and Allison on Saturday mornings with the White Cut Country, and, and I thought, wait, wait a minute here, I am. Um, I'm with Bubba every morning. He's, he's getting closer to retirement, so he's got somebody covering Mondays now. I think his wife convinced him to do that. But. Um, so an extended email, and I told him about all this stuff, and um, where the $550 comes from. And uh, when he played the first song, because they let you put a couple of requests in, and he said, um, Oh, and that first song is for Blaine and Rusek physiotherapy in the little town of Calgary. And I, oh, you silly little Indian, you just, there's no, it's not a physiotherapy. And, and, and I just breathe in, breathe out, good. Yeah, just, <laughs> calm down, it's, above, it's okay, I love you, Baba, it's just, it's fine. So after the next song, he came, he must have looked at the email again, and he came back on and he said, oh, I'm so sorry, everybody, it's not a phytotherapy, it's a, a so it's, it's not physiotherapy, it's phytotherapy. And, and uh, he said, Blaine is a herbalist in Calgary. And, and uh, sometimes people hear that word and think he fixes dogs. I bet Blaine could fix dogs. I bet Blaine could heal anybody. <laughs> and he ended up, um, the people probably hated me at the end of that hour because he, he rattled on and on. Like if I just bought $500 worth of advertising from the station, there's no way I would have got that kind of coverage, right? Like he had a whole story between each song. It's just lovely. So, so I, he, I get one of his shows at least once a year, and, and then share share the love with some of the others. So. Um, anyway, uh, so where did we lose it there? Cold pressed. So what happens? Some of you might have had products from uh, Highwood Crossing, the Marshalls, Tony and Penny Marshall, flax oil, and granola cookies, and all sorts of things. So Tony cruised the world for a couple of years before bringing home his first press from Germany. And, um, you know, the thing is, when you take even the best of the best and you crush something like olives or nuts or whatever, you, you might get 30% of the oil out. The other 70% is still there. So that's when they soak it in hexane or benzene and heat it up just a little, a little over 100 degrees, and they press it again. Now, I, I used to wonder, before I knew all this, I used to wonder uh, what the girls picking olives in little towns in Italy had to do with, like, where's the virgin thing come in, you know? So, so just, you know, and then I do a little research, like, um, I pick a few things up at Costco, and here's a big flat of uh, olive oil, and then beside it is another big flat, and, and they're both Bertoli, sounds Italian. Oh, it's made in Italy, you know? And, and you kind of notice that, and, and so sometimes I don't have a badge on, sometimes people recognize me from a class or something, but you know, so I'm, I'm just interviewing people that are coming for some olive oil. So, so here's the Bertoli olive oil, and there's uh, three liters for $14.95, and right beside it is the cold pressed one, and it's $17.95 for two liters, a liter less for $4 more. Excuse me, sorry, I just noticed your, uh, um, these appear to be the same company. Do you understand the difference between these oils? And, and, and he's like, well, what are you, stupid? There's like $4 or more for a liter less. And he's, he's buying the cheap one. Uh, okay, I'm gonna leave this guy alone. He's made his choice, he's happy, you know? And then a kind of professional looking woman comes along and uh, within a minute and, and uh, same thing. And um, uh, do you understand the difference between these? And, and uh, she said, no, do you? I said, well, as a matter of fact, I do. This is, this is what I do for a living, and this is, this is the picture, you know? So it's got nothing to do with the girls or the women picking the olives. The, the, where that name came from was, we didn't screw it up yet. You know? <laughs> with all the solvents. So even here in Alberta, where we've got a huge factory in Lethbridge with canola products, they have these huge, several stories high, these big tubes that they bubble nitrogen gas through all of that solvent-contaminated oil and the function of the gas, our governments decided that if we can get 
the hexane and benzene residues down to parts per million or something that it's actually safe. I'd rather let somebody else eat that stuff. So whether it's for my use or anything I use in my products, there, I don't sell anything that is, is not cold pressed. Some of them are organic. If they are, it'll say so on the label. If it doesn't say organic, it's not. Some of them I just can't get. Some I do get both ways. Let people make their choice. Like there's rose hemp that's a bottle this size, about six bucks more, maybe, for the organic. So there's one kind of oil that you like that you get from another from one company and then another kind of oil you might get from another company again, based on? <laughs> yeah, well, mostly, even at my level, if I called a manufacturer, it's a, I'm an aromatherapist in Calgary, Alberta, Canada, they just hang out. You know, because they're selling 45 gallon pumps. And I've toured some of those places in other countries. And they're, they're not going to sell. They're, they're shipping 45 gallon drums to brokers. So depending on what it is, like the peppermint that you all tasted is triple distilled, it comes from Washington. And I'm going through a, is that five? I think it's five, five gallons. I go through that much mint about six weeks maybe. But I, I just don't have room to be buying a 45 gallon drum and what I do with it and stuff like that. So the more you buy, the better the price is. But you know, where there's other things like the raspberry seed oil, and I mentioned uh, I'm just buying a four liter jug because most people don't know about it yet. But stuff like grapeseed, almond oil, you know, my big sellers, I usually order about three five gallon pails at a time. And um, most carrier oils have a shelf life of about two years. So some of the high end stuff like uh, rose hip and whatnot, I, I bought one of those little bar fridges, but I, I just put those in there. It's my, just to, just to stretch it a bit. So I guarantee any of my carriers for two years. Because you know, I try and keep it fresh, so I got a, I got a buy right. So that Do you use the same company for most of your oils though? No, I wish it was that simple. Yeah. You know, so there's, you have the, there's, like there's, like yeah, there's so many brokers and I, I need to, every once in a while somebody runs out like, uh, just a few weeks ago, uh, my usual supplier out of the U.S. Uh, was out of lemongrass. And I go through a bit of lemongrass. It's, um, lemongrass is really wonderful at improving the flexibility of connective tissue. So anything to do with gout and arthritis and that sort of thing. It's also a really good antifungal. Okay. So nail bed infections, for example, you know, tea tree is a good choice, but it stinks. You know, lemongrass is clean and fresh, so let's mix some, some of that together. And then you've got stinky hot feet, so let's add a little mint, because that makes it cool. And then we want to help it penetrate through the nails, so let's put some red thyme in there. Not too much. So with things like that, um, and yet I need feedback always, and, and I've made mistakes over the years. That's why when I'm, when I'm doing large audiences, I always kind of go, no matter what you've heard, for better or for worse, Thirty-eight years in, that's how much I really know. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's a huge field. I mean, I've got uses for 1,100 species of plants in Western Canada. There's only so much room in a hard drive. You know? <laughs> so uh, it's a thing. But um, live and learn. Ah, put something on dry skin. That's one thing. Put it on wet skin. The oil wants to get away from the water, and your skin's fatty. So where's it going? You've got to be really careful how much oil you're putting in something like a shower gel, right? Because it's going to absorb a lot faster. So I make an antifungal blend that's going out four different ways. I make it neat, which means full strength, to use on nail bed infections, because I want it strong enough to be able to penetrate through the nail. And if you've got recurring problems with nail fungals like that, you've got to be doing some candida cleanses because that's all associated with leaky gut syndrome. So you've got a big tree living in your belly and you're trying to pull leaves off it on your hands or feet, right? You've got to go after some intestinal cleansing. And of course, when you're having a baby and then you had the baby, passed through a highly yeasty little canal and then you feed it milk with yeast in it and you wonder why your baby's got a yeast infection. So, um, really kind thing to do, you know, the, the most simple, natural thing you can do to get away from uh, 
matter what kind of shampoo you use, is rinse really well. How many people do that? You know, whether it's the kitchen sink or one of those goofy little baby buckets. You know, people just, you know, there's bubbles all over the place and then they kind of towel them off, leaving all that soap residue behind and that's what causes diaper rash. As soon as they pee, you know, with nice breastfed milk, if, if it's clean, it, you got bleach. That's nappy rash. Okay. So they're going to smell like a salad that dilutes some apple cider vinegar. <clears throat> well, 10 to 1 and just get out a big spray bottle and mist them down with that and, you know, and then towel them off. Bye bye nappy grass. You don't have to go buy expensive products for that sort of thing. You just don't. So I've got these, uh, sometimes it's construction workers, which could be either sex these days or wait staff in restaurants, which could be either sex. Um, and they wear the same shoes or boots to work every day. So here's this young woman who's uh, take, taking a little vacation. She's been on the lake for three weeks. And I mean, she had a couple of toes that looked like a dying turtle shell. They were like shades of green and brown, just yeah. about threw up kind of thing. So she'd be, well, she'd be. And, and so, you know, we had, we had the chat. And she said, yeah, okay. And, and she spent a lot of her vacation on the boat dock and she put cotton balls between her toes and put to my directions one drop of the pure oil on each nail that was affected. Right? And then she came back to the club where they all wear the same skirts and white blouses and little black boots. And she had her infection back a matter of weeks and weeks. We didn't treat the shoes. Take some paper towel or packaging that came with the shoes, something crunchy, whatever, even a newspaper if you don't care about a bit of ink getting inside boots, and uh, put a few drops of a blend like that, stuff it into the boots, and bag them. That's also the best thing to do with something like uh, you're detailing your car before a trip and you open the trunk and you go, oh gosh, remember that day when it, I thought it was going to be quicker to go this way and then we got a cloud burst and and it got worse and then we had to go through that swamp and, and like you almost fall over you know when you uh, open the trunk peppermint lemongrass i've rescued fridges just with peppermint lemongrass people say no you're going to throw that out you got something like somebody left this condo with a fridge and freezer full of food and nobody opened the door for two months and there's like literally rotting molding food in there and it gets into the plastics and most people say yeah throw it out no not necessarily a couple of paper towels if it's got metal racks in it. Leave the door shut and there you go. So, so some of what we do, if we're dealing with things like stress-induced high blood pressure, PMS and menopause, um, anything to do where hormones and things like that, we've got some great mimickers with essential oils. The, so that's aroma therapy. The smell is doing the work. It's stimulating you to treat yourself. But when we're putting something on an infected wound or something like nail dead infections, like I was saying, um, no, that's herbal medicine. In some cases, I wish they didn't have a smell because they're not all pretty. Feeling pretty, oh so pretty, so lovely and happy and gay. Can't even use that word anymore. It's not politically correct. You know, all sorts of things have changed in this man's years. Yes. Is, is there a, a therapeutic use to using like a diffuser, or is that mostly just for the pleasure of the smell itself? Well, uh, yeah, good point. Now, first thing is, um, I would love to see products like Glade outright banned. Yeah, yeah I'm not talking about like using some yeah. nice essential oil. Synthetic it? fragrance is about as good for you as fresh <coughs> fragrance. Yeah. And you know when you when you get on an airplane, for example, especially an international flight, when you're looking for your seat, you, you may as well as you're going up the aisle, you may as well just lick everybody's face because by the end of the flight you have pretty much, you know. So um, bathroom motors, um, something that works great in the bathroom, you know, things as uh, common and easy to find as peppermint. There, there's some. Um, Somebody forwarded me a website and I just thought it was clever. Why didn't I think that? It, it, they literally call their line poo pourri. And, and what you do, whether it's a spray or the pure drops, so I, I've got a blend of it called Mindful, it's just super fresh. You can have uh, rotting sand that's with fish guts on them in a black truck and you know, you're gonna have to shampoo everything. No, no, just leave the park in the sun and put a few drops in, in, 
carpets. You know? But if, if you've had a dump, like I make something called fart be gone. And, and uh, that was originally cleanse and restore. It, it had the same original intent as uh, the thieves blend that's become so popular. Uh, but I, I didn't want, I was trying to make something smell nicer. I didn't want to call it sick bay because any health professional would back me up in saying that, you know, if, if you are in an elevated mood, you, you heal faster. You know, like uh, uh, I unfortunately, A doctor friend with her fingers up my butt <clears throat> about something, four and a half years ago now said, Lena, I'm so sorry to tell you this, but uh, you know, your prostate's exactly where you should be, and it's soft and round, and it's the right size, and you've been taking care of things, obviously, but you've got some junk in the trunk, so we got to have a biopsy done. So I have my prostate removed. <coughs> and the morning after the surgery, which was in the afternoon, Surgeon's assistant was coming around real early in the morning. I was sitting there, I got up, brushed my hair and my teeth, and was reading the newspaper. He looked at his chart and went, oh, are you, are you Blaine Andrews? And I said, yeah. I was, uh, um, he said, well, you look great. And I said, well, is that a problem? And he said, no, it's just not what people usually look like after 12 hours after surgery, but, you know. And, and so, and, and I'm reading, you, you were out of bed at one in the morning dancing with your, apparatus in the hallway and busted out of, of the ward so you could get out and I was humming Strauss waltzes and spinning all the gear around and they, they put all that stuff in there. So when the surgeon came around that afternoon he said, you know, this doesn't come up very often but um, it kind of looks like you know what you're doing and I think you'd be happier at home. So I stayed for lunch because the soup sounded good and I, I was out of there in something like 36 hours. He said, We're, nobody's throwing you out. Stay all week if you want. There's better hotels. In town, but, you know, it's you know, so things that elevate the mood uh, are great. And so in the winter months, especially in public places, and because there's so many things that take the lungs, because we breathe, right, is uh, that's when the leaf oils. So a thing that, um, uh, I'm going to sort of wrap it with this, we can, we can easily spend an hour just on this topic, but until you get to know more about any particular oil, because like I said, I can teach you chemistry for a week. And it gets a bit complicated. You just get to know each oil that you find attractive. You know, that, and, and look it up and kind of get to know it. And you'll slowly pick up some of the chemistry. That, you know, you can be a lot freer with lavender and oregano, for example. Oregano and red timer. The ones I call big guns. So you've got to be careful. So I would rather, uh, like a formula that I got from, uh, you might see his and his wife's books around once in a while. Been a few conferences over the years where uh, Gary Young from Young Living uh, has brought Daniel Tenwell from Paris in for conferences, and um, I was thrilled to meet people like that early in my career because, at the same time in the early 30s, there were medical doctors in France and Germany that were using essential oils extensively, but all the data was only published in French and German. In the meantime, English women came to France, and that. That was the start of what the whole world now calls the, the English method, which is ultra love. So people like Valerie Woodwood and I would probably not get along because if we can tread lightly, my, one of my favorite underlying themes is lots of little doses. I would rather use something milder to reapply every hour than to go in with guns blazing when we don't need to. And then just like the old parable about the little boy who cried wolf. If you actually need something stronger, then get out the big guns. So one that I got uh, as a guideline, I call it Candy Buster, because uh, Dr. Pinwell's original uh, use for that was uh, for lowering candida. And he would have people take anything oral of this nature, three to five drops, four to five times a day, never more than that. It, it's just going to cause problems. So it's basically seven parts tea tree, one oregano, you could substitute red thyme, one cinnamon, you could substitute clove, because they're very similar, and um, one peppermint, just to help that whole mess taste better. And I can't believe the versatility that people have come up with. Like there was a gal who used to teach physiology at the uni, and um, her and the man who became her husband, and a girlfriend of hers, uh, we're going trekking Southeast Asia for a couple of months. And she's explaining, what should I do? 
so I had enough stuff to cover that table. She said, no, we've got to cut it in half. We're backpacking for three months. Okay. No, we've got to cut it in half. So she, she ended up, the two girls took two bottles this size of that candy buster, and we discussed that, okay, every time you fill your water bottle, put two drops in, give it a good shake. And then if you've been out in the bush for three days, how many people with unclean hands are using that well? And you're, you're meeting and greeting people. Before you walk into the next village, take a drop or two in your hands. So at least we know you're sterile. The man who became husband was sick five days into the trip and at great expense flew from hospital to hospital before he finally got back to Calgary and he missed the entire trip. And the, the girls had a wonderful time for two and a half months for a total investment of about $25. Again? Seven parts tea tree, one part oregano. The only thing I would switch that up with would be red thyme because they're almost the same. Uh, cinnamon or clove, and one part pepper. And one part cinnamon or clove? Yeah, not both. And what's this used for? Anything, like yeah. a, a spider bite, a dog bite. Um, dubious water, I'm not guaranteeing it for beaver okay. fever kind of thing, but I mean obviously these guys were drinking it was just, and, and the hubby didn't want anything to do with it because he thought it just tasted like crap, so he wouldn't, he wouldn't take the water. And you dilute this in how much oil? No, no oil. Well water. Oh, and water? Yeah, oh, okay. yep. give it a good shape before each drink. Okay. So there's some oils you're saying you can't put in water, but others you don't? Well, that's why I'm emphasizing the, if, if we put Where's the dip tube and the bottle? Right? If I take tap water and put a couple mils of essential oil in here, when I'm making room sprays in a bottle this size, I add four mils. That's a third of that. Okay? It's quite a bit because I want them to smell up the car or the room without wearing out my finger. Otherwise, you can have repetitive strain disorder because you like aromatherapy, right? So, um, what I use, there's hundreds of cosmetic chemicals that come from coconuts. And one of them, and it like, you know, if you crack open a coconut, it looks milky, right? And that's fat and water holding hands. And somebody found a way of isolating that emulsifier, and then they, they go even further with those extractions from plant sources of, with different molecular weights. So you need a different product if you're making lipstick or a lip balm than if you're making a room spray. So the one that I get, uh, I put four mils of essential oil and four mils, or a little extra, of the emulsifier. I mean, I'm making gallon jugs of this stuff, and then we just pour them all at once. And you shake it once, and it stays mixed. And that's why when the sprays are fresh, you'll notice they look milky, because that's that coconut emulsifier. So, uh, that's very important. Yeah. Um, so, just finishing with the points, I prefer lots of little doses. A lot of what I do with essential oils, I would never call aromatherapy. It's part of herbal medicine. But aromatherapy, you know, uh, I, I'm sure tonight I'll be fine. I, I didn't want to start on a sad note, but I, I had a, somebody close to me attempt suicide yesterday, twice. Um, jumping in front of the train didn't work. They must have stopped. So when she got home, she cut her wrist. Eesh. Anyway, so I barely slept. And uh, other than the nectarine and an organic banana, I haven't eaten all day, so that's why I'm doing that. But, um, lots of little doses. There's many aspects to all of this. And, and as you try new oils, if the oil, it's just simple, if the oil comes from roots, like vetiver, it's going to be calming and grounding. I'm, I'm not a cowboy. But uh, when I have to deal with a sick horse, and I've treated a lot, I'm not going in there without putting a couple of drops of vetiver on. Now, you want a great experiment. Horses' noses are this big, right? <laughs> nice puppy, you know, and, and, and you get these wingnut thoroughbreds that just melt in your hands, you know? So I got a lot of trainers that use them at shows. The oils like cedar wood and rosewood which is what 
helps the tree stand tall in the forest when life is making you wither. Woods. Sandalwood's more expensive, but woods will help you stand tall. The factory workers on all of our green plants are leaves. And so anything that's stressing out your respiratory system, take a couple of drops, close your eyes. Don't put it on me, you're gonna make your face all red. A couple of drops, close your eyes. Not quite touching, just breathe deep for a whole minute. Got a sore throat? Rub a little bit on the outside too. And that's going back to your question. So in the winter months, you got sick people, sick kids, or whatever. Preemies, almost always, lungs develop last, right? So premature babies have very compromised lungs. I had a student years ago, uh, you probably know Kim, um, Kim Price, Kim Alana. Yeah. Um, they had a, a son and then two QE patootie little blonde girls, um, and uh, major problems. You know, the, there's this thing called the Chinese clock. And everything shows up like um, 11 to 1 is liver. That's why it's a lousy habit to have a snack and a glass of wine at midnight while watching a movie. I'm bad for that. Then, um, no, two. One to three? One to three, yeah, thanks. So, 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 thank you. If, if you wake up at two in the morning and, and you've got a major sweat on, that's probably liver heat. And then three to five is lungs. So these little girls were waking up the whole house at four o'clock every night of the week. So we put a diffuser, one of the air pump types, in the bedroom between the two beds uh, with something called Raven Sara in it. And um, I always have to be careful when I say they never woke up again. We didn't kill them. It's just that they, they have slept soundly since, right? Um, so, and so it goes. So then five to seven is bowel, and that's why you know, if you wake up at six in the morning and have to hit the can right away to have a poo, that, that's, that's right on the clock, you see. So anyway, um, sick or compromised anybody, and, and then I guess this will be my last comment. Uh, oh, well, and then flowers are like their faces. So we use floral oils for skincare, but they're actually the plants having sex, right? So, you know, um, we use those so-called aphrodisiacs and whatnot, you know, perfumes and such. And then if they worked, plant got lucky, so to speak. Um, anything that comes from seeds or fruits, right, are good for digestion. Like vermouth, Earl Grey tea. Right? It's just green tea with, with bergamot. Right? And you can, if you love the smell of bergamot, you, you can order, it's usually the same price. If you see on a label or a price list, FCF, that means furrow coumarins removed, furrow coumarin free. And then you can use it in your sun mix or whatever and go golfing and you're not gonna look like you got herpes over half of your body. Yeah. Can I just go back to your comment about the hydrosols for eyes? Because oh, yeah. occasionally I get subjectivitis and I've been using green myrtle hydrosol, which has worked yes. fantastic. Yes. I can't get it anymore. I, I haven't had it for it. three years. If we got it from Madagascar, Ray Dunphy used to bring it in and I would always get a Whole four liter jug when she was ordering. Yeah, they, they haven't been able to find it, and that, that's the that's the the only. It's the only thing. Like when I'm doing herb walks, normally as soon as I go to drive home, I'm going to put on a pair of Serengetis. But when I'm teaching, I feel like you need to see my eyes for communication. So I wear floppy hats and that sort of thing. But by the end of the day, if it's breezy, especially the start of the pollen season, I look like I've been sniffing glue. And, and the first thing I do when I get back to the truck is literally hold my eye open and spray Myrtle Hydrosol right on my eyeball. Yeah, and I swear, right. it, it, it's like an angel kissed your eye. You know? Like, it, it's just brilliant. So, um, uh, daycares, you know, I, I've had students that run daycares and you get, like, conjunctivitis can be viral or bacterial or um, fungal, right? And you don't know, you just gotta, it's contagious and away you go. So there was, um, some years ago, I made the mistake of covering my face, not just my mouth. And I had a really bad chest infection, so I transferred a virus into my eyes. And during a full weekend class, a person sitting real close to me went, Bling, there's pus coming out of your left eye. And I was like, great. <laughs> and that was just a couple days before Halloween, and I, I was so exhausted, and I woke up at about 10 o'clock on Halloween, 
and both of my eyes were virtually swollen shut. So I went to the ER, and I finally, yeah, they whisked me, and some of the staff knew me. And I got this lady doctor, not that that matters, and uh, uh, she, she said, well, I'm gonna give you some antibiotic eye drops here. I said, well, what if it's viral? Because I think it probably is. And she said, well, um, I got nothing for you. And I said, well, I do. And she said, what are you gonna do? And I said, I'm gonna take this blend that I make for cold sores. And a couple of drops, a couple of drops of the emulsifier. But if you use distilled water, you don't need the emulsifier. So for vaginal work, or the eyes, where you're gonna make it really dilute, what was the magic number? Two to three parts per thousand. So just do the math. Almost every aromatherapy book on every shelf of every store will tell you there's 20 drops in a mill. If you are ever anywhere in the world and you find a pipette or a dropper that dispenses 20 drops add up to a mill, phone me immediately. I'll charter a helicopter to come and witness that because I've been trying to find one of those. I, I, I used to do product launches five states wide for Aroma Vera, former largest distributor in, in the U.S. Excellent product. And uh, all of their propaganda said there's 20 drops in a mill. Something wasn't adding up. So I take a, a bottle of their lavender. It was a 15 mil bottle. These are 12. Saturday morning. i, I got to get this right. Oh. They're like uh, 640 drops. According to the company's data, there's 300 in there. I, thought, I, I must have been dreaming. For it back in a graduate to check that I actually got 15 mils, like the label says. 637. One more time. 630. Okay, okay. With the dropper tops on that product line, you get 40 drops. In. The ones that I'm using and a lot of other uh, stuff around town that you'll find is uh, on average because the viscosity will change that, right? Like lemon is hard to count 10 drops because it just about pours out. And something like vetiver or myrrh, if, if you don't adjust the orifice, I mean, you, you can bake a cake while you're trying to count eight drops of myrrh. It's like, <laughs> hey, March, yeah, um, <laughs> well, yeah, I just, if I'm a little distracted, I'm just counting eight drops of the uh, vetiver here, one. And, um, <laughs> Um, I just, you know, we, we both enjoyed the no cheese cheesecake so much. It, uh, am I too old to ask for the recipe? Hang on, Richard. Two. You know, like, I, I'm not like, kidding. Vacuum your neighbor's car while you. Anyway, we got to wrap it. Are you are you closing now? Yeah. Closing. <laughs> so, with the, with the eye thing. So somebody had told me that corn flour could be used right in the eye. Corn flour hydrosol. Is that correct? Don't know. Corn I really missed the green myrtle hydrosol. Whenever I get an eye irritation, yep. it was the one that I could use right in the eye. Yeah. Like so what I'm saying is, you, you can do that because that night when the when the doctor said, "What are you going to do? What's in it?" She wrote it down. Yeah. And then when I stopped at the pharmacy on the way home to get just in case the the, the gel that she'd given me a prescription for, uh, I said, "Well, I think it's viral, but I'll, I'll just buy this and keep it around." And she said, "Well, then what are you going to do?" And the pharmacist took my recipe as well and wrote it down because you know. So what I'm saying is, you can make the equivalent to a hydrosol if, if you just go back to the math, that's where I segue, I'm bad for that, um, to two to three parts per thousand, just use distilled water. Oh, and the essential oil. Yeah, the myrtle and just use myrtle essential oil. There was a, an occasion where uh, I was with Dorothy, Dorothy's wife, ex, and um, she was out helping me get camp all set up for one of these camp out trip things and uh, we were having lunch and we got all the wood tidied up and stacked and I kind of went, oh, how did we miss that one? The reason we missed it, it was it wasn't ours. Somebody else had left this here like a year ago and it was a big branch under a whole bunch of dirt shavings and stuff of a dead lodge coal pine and I, I went to throw it on the kindling pot and it didn't move so of course I'm a guy so you pull it harder and it still didn't move so I gave it a really good tug and this thing flipped up and got me right in the face. Uh, two, two needles were going through my eyelid and one was right in the eyeball, right at the edge of my iris. And I, I went up to the truck mirror, the outside one, and, and tilted it over so I could see what I was doing. And she said, what do you want to do? Should we go back to town? And I said, no, I think, 
and I remember looking over and I said, I wish I had some German chamomile here, but I don't, so I'm just gonna use some lavender. But I had a water bottle about half that size that had distilled water in it. So I put six drops of, at that point, my eye was completely bloodshot. Right? And I, I just started irrigating it about every 20 minutes and the students were coming that night. There was nothing to see. If you were this close, maybe, but just fine. But I, I was always, the way my brain worked in a crisis is I think about weird things like, what a weird sound pulling a lodgepole pine needle out of your eye. And there's this little <laughs> sound, you know? And, and part of my brain, because I go into weird states in tra trauma situations, I paused because I thought, if I, if I start shaking, I'm going to need surgery. i got to be dead calm here. Breathe in, breathe out, feel good, that's nice. And then I paused again, and Dorothy said, what's wrong? And I said, well, I'm just a little worried that when I pull it out, I'm going to go spinning around the forest backwards. You know, like when you let a balloon go, it is. <laughs> That's, that's my twisted sense of humor. So Blaine's not joking when he says he has a thousand hours of stories. Yeah. And yeah. Thank you very much. It's a real pleasure. Yeah. So we're, we're just after six. And I'd love to get the staff out of here by 6.30. But if you do have yeah. more questions for Blaine, you need to grab anything. Then. Hunting stores. Thanks, man. Yeah. Glad to be here. I feel much better than I around. Go for putting your files. Yeah, when you get the little for a first aid kit, this, this, no, this is the one for shotgun shells. A little more practical because these little vials, they break real easy. These are tough, but these little guys, they crack real easy. You can't just have those in, in your purse and throw it on a truck floor. Like the, it's going to break and wreck your purse or whatever. So you, know, you can buy those at hunting stores. And uh, this little one, I always like this. There's certain shotguns. This is wrecked now because it was used for years and years and years. But this is elastic, and there's certain shotguns. They're, this is called a choke tube case. There's certain shotguns where the end of the barrel screws off, and if you're hunting eastward, way up high, you, you put on one that chokes it more, and if you're hunting pheasant with a dog this far away, you, you want it spreading a lot, because, you know, stuff like that. So what's the single largest bottle in here? Carrier. Yeah, the carrier oil, right? And then things that I'm gonna use a lot more, hiking and stuff like that, uh, like, strains and sprains, that kind of thing. I have helped hundreds of people with this on business trips, going through airports, that'll make it. Um, and uh, hiking, you know, there's the bear spray and everything else, hundreds and hundreds of people. Uh, one of the smaller vials, I, you know how the psychiatrists tell us, if you ever die in a dream, if you ever die in a dream, you probably have. I think I've proven that wrong. But I had a dream one night. I had a dream one night that I got stuck on a on a little ledge. You might die, you know, with Malcolm's dying behind you there. Last story for sure, for sure, for sure. I got stuck in heavy fog with two women on a little ledge high in the mountains, and they both had PMS, and, and I said the wrong thing. So. I woke up just before I splatted, and I haven't left home without PMS plans since. <laughs> Thank you all. Wait, what oils did you use to make that wine gum scent? They really did smell like wine gum. Oh, yeah. No, no.